and welcome. I'm Lisa Thompson, Planning Director at Wavemaker North, um, and today I'm joined by an amazing panel who will be joining us shortly. At the end of the session, we'll be holding a short Q&A, so please get your questions to us via the Slido box and we'll try to get through as many as, 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 many as we possibly can. Um, just to recap on what we heard this morning, the All In Census found that there was um, that people from working class backgrounds underrepresented in the advertising industry, um, accounting for just 19% versus 39% of the working population. Now, the industry needs clearly needs a system change that inhibits recruit that it stops people from recruitment and hin inhibits um, progression. But it's really important that we start with the lived experiences of people in the industry. And so we're just going to start, start with a short video that has been specially created for the summit. When I had joined the agency, we would sometimes get into discussions about, you know, what school everyone kind of went to. It was kind of like, you know, one of those discussions where everyone would get to know each other. I slowly realized that everyone around me kind of went to private school um, and everyone kind of had a middle class background. So when it kind of came to me sharing my experience of what school I went to, no one had a clue about what school I went to. And I think it was then and there that I knew I was kind of different from everyone else. I felt like I didn't matter because of my background. Because when I was at a Christmas party, um, a gentleman older than me harassed me. And when I tried to report it to HR, they frankly didn't take me too seriously. So that report ended up going nowhere. And also sometimes I kind of felt like I had to suppress the way I spoke. Um, being surrounded by people from a middle class background, you know, everyone kind of pronounced their T's and S's. Um, and I slowly, in a way, started to conform, started to almost mimic the way they spoke, um, kind of during meetings and brainstorm. So in a way, I kind of felt like once I went into the building, I kind of had to leave a part of me at the door. There was another time where I pitched an idea of my creative partner to the creative director. He absolutely ripped our idea into shreds, so this was quite disappointing. But on the very same pitching, there was a gentleman who was middle class, and when he pitched the exact same idea, the creative director praised him for it. I really didn't like the agency culture, and it made me feel left out and excluded. This is why I ended up moving on to a new pathway in my career. I'm sure you'll agree that there's some really shocking moments in that video, and we'd like to discuss that further. So I'm now going to welcome our panellists for the session. Co-founder of Com Commercial Break, James Hillhouse, visual artist Israel Kajuri, and founding partner of Lucky Generals, Andy Nairn. Um, so James, I'll start with you. Your organisation works with agencies and brands to create opportunities from young, uh, for young people from working class backgrounds um, and ultimately to improve their career prospects. Can you please give us your thoughts on what you heard in the film and tell us where we're going wrong and how we can fix it? Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, I think, I think that film is a, is a great reminder that, that ultimately this is, this is about people. And this is about how we treat them. And I think what the guys have done there is they've nailed that if we think this is just about recruitment, then, then we got it horribly wrong. You know, yes, this is why we're here to discuss this, but we want to get working class talent in. But we've, we've got to make sure that once they are in, that we've created work environments where, where they can get on too. And, and I think... I think that's why class is different to many other types of diversity. You know, I've, I've seen lots of places that have diversified their workforce by getting in different people, but from the same middle class background. So they still know that world. They can still navigate that world. But, it, but if you're not familiar with that world and with the codes of the middle class, which by, which by the way are really hard to see, even harder yeah. to navigate, you know, from, from the way we speak to the clothes we wear to the stuff we talk about, then you're immediately coming in feeling other 
And everything you're seeing and experiencing is, is reinforcing that. And, and then if you add into that mix, the lack of processes we have in place to, to aid progression and the lack of time we're willing to give to progression, then the odds are really stacked against you. So I, I think what I really think is that the reality is that if we want to make this work, what we've got to do first is we've got to create the change ourselves and stop expecting new people coming in to create the, the change for us. So instead of rushing into recruitment, what we've got to do is, you know, we've got to do a load of unglamorous stuff, really, of thoroughly preparing the ground first, and then as a very last thing, recruiting. So to, to the other part of your question, how do we, we do this? Well, I want to suggest two things to, to everyone listening. One is, one is, I guess, a big project, and one is something you can do by the end of today. So the big project thing is just a, it's a five-step process that we work on with agencies. But to be honest, it's one that you can do yourself anyway, which is number one, understand why you want to do this, what you want to do, and understand what the issue is from lived experience. Second thing is audit yourself, work out how well your business or agency is set up to get working class people in or, or otherwise. Third thing you do is once you've found out what the issues are, create a plan of change. And, and I think that's probably going to boil down to looking at culture practices and processes. Fourth thing is work out how you're going to sustain it, which is sort of two parts, really, a, a kind of an Ofsted style part of holding yourself to account, making sure it's happened. But also, how are you going to support people along that journey of, of change? And then the fifth thing, last of all, last of all, is do the, do the recruitment, yeah? So, so that, I mean, listen, that is a big thing, right? And that takes time. It's necessary. What you can do right now after this event finishes, that we'll get the ball rolling, I think, are, are three things. So by the end of the day, first is get your antennae up. Observe your agency for the rest of, rest of the day. Observe that world you live in. Look at it through the working class filter that you're going to learn about on, on this panel and just see what you notice. I think the second thing is just get a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. At one end put, we change everything. At the other end put, we change nothing. And then just work out where your agency or your company is willing to sit and work out what you're willing to sacrifice as, as a result. And then the third thing, it's a negative thing, but it's positive to be negative. It's just, it's just write a list of roadblocks from tiny things to massive things about what will stop you on that journey. So I, I listen, I, I guess my main thing really is that we've got to do the hard jobs now so that we can ensure that we're not just going to get working class talent in, but we're setting the stage for them to thrive once they actually are in. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting point that we can't just recruit our industry. We need to make sure that it's fit for purpose. Now, Andy, just coming to you as an agency founder, I'd just really like to hear what your thoughts are, were about what you saw in the film. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, just a mixture of emotions. Like I guess a lot of people, it's sort of um, a mixture of, you know, anger, frankly, and sadness and quite a lot of just frustration about why are we excluding so many amazing talented people from an industry that's supposed to be all about creativity. Um, and we are blocking a huge chunk, I think 39% of the population is what you sort of said earlier, um, out of the situation. And and that that seems wrong on so many levels. I mean, it's, it's most obviously it's just like wrong ethically, you know, that we have a situation where people don't feel, you know, able to bring their whole selves into work. That's just wrong. So we should fix that regardless of, um, any of the other aspects, but it's it's also wrong in particular because of class, um, as I'm sure we'll be talking about, intersects with so many other issues in, in the diversity conversation, and you know, in particular with race. Um, so there's a sort of a double whammy going on there. Um, for me, it's a it's a personal thing as well because you know um, that would exclude huge chunks of my family, um, past and present. But but most of all, I think as a as a leader of an agency, it's just commercially the stupidest approach ever because we are we're an industry as i say that depends on creativity and i want us to be the best most creative interesting fizzy exciting organization um in a, in a really thriving industry and we're, we're literally excluding like um half almost half of the population and you know when i look at our own clients i look at people like um you know we, we work with a co-op um or yorkshire tea or amazon these are like mainstream mass market brands um with huge working class you know aspects to their um, marketing and you know what chance have we got with connecting with those you know audiences if we've got if, if everyone you know in, in our agencies doesn't you know doesn't have that perspective so we need to bring these experiences into the room as we're starting to do now um, 
I, I think that my main thing is that, um, and I, I love the words of Karen Blackett, who's you know uh, just fantastic in all all subjects on DE and I. But I think her perspective is brilliant when she says that we should see this as an opportunity. You know, a lot of the time we see all the problems and the challenges, and of course there are lots because this is like really deep rooted stuff in society um you know that's bigger than our industry and bigger than our little offices and all the rest of it but um but fundamentally this is an opportunity we are currently excluding in this case 39 percent of the entire population and all the creativity and brilliant thinking that exists there um so this is our opportunity to increase our um opportunities by that same 39 percent um, and what, what a brilliant, where, where are you ever going to get a better offer than that as a leader of an agency to sort of have a massive increase in creativity? So I feel like we've got to, you know, get over, you know, as, as James says, there's so many, you know, little roadblocks and barriers. And, but again, we're a creative industry. We, you know, what we're good at is like solving problems, isn't it? So um, where we see a roadblock, we should think, right, okay, the, the old way of doing, tackling that is just not going to work. So we've got to think of different different ways around it and apply our creative brains if we've got any to um to turning this into a fantastic yeah. opportunity for people that's what i'm excited by um I, I very much agree with the the fact that we should be putting in you know the inclusion is the hard part it's it's um you know it's not this is not about recruitment otherwise we're just setting ourselves up to fail and that has been absolutely proven now right across the diversity debate i think um what i would say is even the recruitment thing we need to think more uh imaginatively about you know because one of the issues certainly in london we face is that you can find the right people um and then they can't afford to live in london unless they've got you know wealthy parents or that they already have a sort of connections here so that in itself is a buyer and that's something that we've tried to you know tackle as an agency in our internships for instance by paying for accommodation um as well as just you know a good decent sort of internship wage so um we've, we've just got to rethink everything and, and, and I, I really like what james was sort of saying there about just viewing everything through this lens that we perhaps haven't looked at things through uh, in recent years yeah and i think that's a really key point that we want to do the best work for our clients and this is actually a way to solve it and um, now israel mm -hmm. just coming to you you've completed several internships at leading agencies and I just want to get your view on what you think companies should be doing to make sure talent feels fully supported and um, but also really able to thrive once they're in the industry. Mm -hmm. So James and Andy have touched on this as well um, but again it's just agencies need to follow through on their commitment as opposed to just getting in like working past with diverse people as like a tick box exercise so talent needs to actually feel like they belong and that they actually can progress as well and you know, agencies tend to do a really good job at welcoming in talent, but like things start to fall off once they actually settle into that day-to-day -day experience. So that's quite enough to structure. Um, structure is massively important. You know, we all know advertising can, can get super hectic and busy, but it's often in those moments that it's like the people who are just kind of getting their foot into the door. It's massively detrimental to them because they're kind of, things get busy, things get busy and they're often just kind of left in the dust, not knowing what to do. Um, next, I think it's important that agencies make it safe for talent to be themselves as well. Um, you know, in a predominantly white middle class industry, the culture can feel like it is a code that you're having to like desperately crack just to kind of fit in. Um, so that assimilation itself feels like you're at odds with your own authentic self, and that can be extremely draining. And to basically wear a mask just to exist at work all day. So, you know, um, talent to kind of be recognised and understood individuals, so they feel comfortable, and that you also can play to their strengths as well. Um, also, I think if there are any issues for them, there needs to be a simple and safe grievance process. If they have any issues, um, they can voice them about it being a task or a barrier in itself. Um, and there also a set to add to that workflow needs to be carefully managed. So you need to ensure that there is work for talent to do. And to add to that, you don't want to just kind of give them like, give them the fodder or like, the low priority work because it's quite obvious when that's the case. And that can be massively demotivating when you feel like you're not good enough because you're getting like the bottom of the pile work. Um, but at the same time as well, don't overwhelm them and bombard them with too much work. It's just not um, realistic for them to be able to handle that. Um, there needs to be dedicated mentors as well. Um, so I'd say it's not just grabbing the nice, friendly person in the office, kind of being involved you need to have somebody who's, you know, really committed to actually taking that talent under their wing and ensuring that they thrive. And that's with, you know, regular training, uh, constructive feedback, exposure to great sort of opportunities, you know, just overall valuing that talent by investing some time and effort into building them up. And I just mentioned training, and um, it's super, super essential that talent are trained and not just employed. Because uh, if you are from a working class background, on sorry, you haven't had that exposure to like um, traditional ad school education. So that just needs to be taken into consideration. Like, um, I think 
learning on the job can be great, but I think it's still lacking in some aspects because there's only so much you can kind of get without that uh, extra mentoral support and also being taught like essential skills and fundamentals that you wouldn't know otherwise. Um, and, you know, I think to add to all this as well, don't just put the onus on that individual as well to do all this, but whether that's for them to create opportunities for themselves, ask for training for themselves, build the relationships for themselves, it needs to be more of a joint responsibility. And um, I think lastly as well, you want to kind of leave a positive impression on them going forward, like even beyond their family agency. So they feel like you've had their back throughout and beyond, you know, that's, you know, utilizing the connections you might have in the industry and putting them towards potential opportunities for their setup for the next steps. Thanks. Yeah, I think what's really clear is that this debate isn't just about human resources. It's about every single mm -hmm. person in the agency being on board and being aware of their biases. Um, and I think as I was thinking about today, um, I didn't really realize until quite recently that this was a personal issue to me. And I think that's because I've been incredibly lucky where I ended up. Um, I'm from a working class background. I'm state school educated. I was first generation to go to university, which I'll be honest with tuition fees as they are now, I wouldn't have done. Um, and you can probably hear my dulcet tones. So I'm a northerner. Um, and what's really alarming is these stats mean that I'm five times less likely to be here today than a white privileged man. And that's being very aware of the fact there's the privilege of being white. Um, and actually, it's scary to think had I ended up in the places where the people in the video turned it up, actually would my northern accent and education fared so well? And to be honest, that's unacceptable. Um, but I think just to echo what Andy said, it's not only un unacceptable, we're not doing the best work because of it. So I think what's really interesting about social class as a diversity metric is it's one that we used to be quite good at. So if you look at ad agencies in the 70s and 80s, the industry had working class um, talent working with middle class talent and creating a golden age of work. Um, and whilst I absolutely agree, some things should stay in the 70s and 80s, indoor smoking, some but not all fashion choices. I think if we could try and mimic those elements, um, we'd really go far. Um, and it'd be brilliant if we could bring that back, but obviously with a really important 21st century intersectional lens. Um, and it's not just for moral reasons, it's good business sense. So I know Andy touched on this, but evidence shows that companies who have class diversity are more creative, more innovative and more productive. And in fact, they can increase their revenue by 33%. So this should be a no brainer for us. Um, but I think what's really exciting about this panel today is in my IPA essay, I argued that in order to tackle social class, we first needed to measure the problem. So we knew there was a problem, but we weren't entirely sure exactly what it was. And it's really exciting that we have concrete data that we can cross tabulate and use as a target to measure success. And um, so it's a brilliant first step, but it's really important. It's only step one. We should do what James said and really audit our culture and work with parties like Commercial Break, but also the Social Mobility Foundation and actively invite them into our industry bodies and agencies and help them hold us to account. Um, we should also um, really ensure that we scrap certain things that are just making it impossible. So our pay structures, we shouldn't be expecting anyone to work for free. We should all pay a real living wage. And actually just remember when we interview a CV full of um, free work experience is a privilege, it's not an asset. And actually, yeah. is that as good as someone who's worked like I did in a bookies through uni and observed some real life? Um, we need to really make sure we look at our culture and when we interview, we judge on potential, not polish. Because actually, when you look into it, some of the ways we assess people is actually nonsense and it doesn't really mean anything. And actually, we, want, we should want people that are different to us because that will offer the best work. And it's only then we can then start to look at our education policy. Um, but ultimately, this is a really exciting first step that we've got. Um, and I know that there's really good will in this area. I've been part of the Common People launch and the response to that has been amazing. And I know there's some brilliant agencies doing some great things already. So I think we just need to make sure that today is step one and we really take this seriously and take a long, hard look at the way we act. Um, so we're going to move to the Q&A shortly, but I've just got one final question for Israel. So Israel, we know you're not currently pursuing an in uh, a career in the industry um, mm -hmm. but what advice would you give to young people starting out when they join into the industry and how to make the most out of their experience um i think first i think in my experience um not to sound flippant i feel like advertising is taken too seriously in some aspects and again it's not too flippant but it's more like you know it's not open heart surgery um 
I feel like, and it's not to undermine the talent and the sort of hard work that goes into it, but I think there tends to be a bit of like a warped mindset around like importance. Sometimes it can be a bit too self-important and self-indulgent. And I feel like if you're just young and getting through the front door, like it can be overwhelmingly daunting if you feel like you have to kind of suddenly come in and be that elite, world-changing superhero just so your work or you feel worthy for the industry. And, you know, if things aren't going well, you'll end up feeling like it's the end of the world. In reality, it's like you're probably struggling to crack a brief for a yogurt brand or something like that. So it's just good to kind of take a step back and like assess your perspective at times. Um, I'd say, uh, separately from that, though, kind of take the time to like research and look into the agencies as well. Like really do your time and really like look into the work they do, the people that are there, what they have to offer. And, um, you know, to add to that as well, the connection, especially in this, in, in this industry can be super, super helpful and super key. Like, so reaching out to people and these agencies can expand your network. But at the same time, it's also just like, um, you know, Sometimes it's not who you know, what you know, it's who you know, and you never know. Just knowing someone to be the uh, changing point that kind of opens the door for opportunities and jobs. Um, you know, getting into advertising is exciting when you're young and new to it, but you want to be sure that you're not just diving straight into it, uh, into the deep end because in some instances you can just leave it feeling like burnt out mentally, uh, physically, and creatively as well. And you kind of want to avoid that. You want to feel too deterred from the industry by being too hasty to join. Um, and yeah, just finally, I think just be mindful of your well-being overall. I think lockdown has us questioning our careers in general and how we work. Um, so it's only natural that if you are young and you're new to the industry, you want to prove yourself when you're starting out. But um, don't make the kind of mistake of like it should be at the cost of your well-being, but you know it should be at the cost of your health. And you shouldn't really measure your talent or work by how much you can overwork and burn yourself out. So yeah. Um, thanks. And we're just going to move to the Q&A. So the first question we've got is, what defines being working class for you? Um, and is it possible for someone who is from a working class background to transition into middle class or is it fixed? James, I'm going to hand that one over to you. Ha, thanks. Uh, so I think, so I think, well, OK, so there's the there's, there's sort of academic uh, definition of it. So it's about um, to lots of places define working class by the job that your parents had uh, when you were 14. And if it's a non-professional background, I mean, something like the Social Mobility Foundation will have lots of information on that. But I think it's about way more than that. It's it's about culturally uh, what you value, what you don't value, how you've been brought up, how you talk. It's, it's about a, a bunch of, it's about a bunch of different things really. Um, and I think there's a mistake just to think it's about, it's about money. But I think it's also a mistake. So. Probably actually Israel can speak about this uh, better than me because we, we've talked about this before. But it's also a mistake to think that necessarily a transition to middle class is a desirable thing. So I think one of, one of the great things about this panel is that it's been set up as talking about working class talent. It hasn't been set up about social mobility. So uh, social mobility as a term itself, I think, kind of implies that you want to take on the airs and graces. Of, of the class above that you want to spend your days in Waitrose buying avocados. But you don't necessarily want to do that. And what, what we don't want to do is what Israel uh, was talking about, is we, we don't want to assimilate different talent. We want to bring talent in, give them opportunities, give them pay, but allow them to, to stay the same. And, and that point mm -hmm. of difference is, is what makes them valuable. And what Lisa was mentioning, you know, those great creatives from back in the day, they, they kind of retained that and that's meant that they did brilliant populist advertising. So, so I don't know if that answers the question. I think there's an academic definition, there's a kind of cultural definition. And then, yeah, I, I, I'd question whether the, the middle class thing, but of course, people advance like the classes all the time, don't they, up and down, like a, like a ladder, but whether we want to is a different thing. Thanks. And just one of the questions is, what are some of the ways that we can measure progress against this? So the Social Mobility Foundation have an index that every year you as a company can enter and you submit loads of data and you can get your staff to fill in about how they feel, whether it holds them back. Um, and actually, if you do that every year, you then get a progress report that then tells you how you're doing, how, you perform, how you're performing, um, and actually gives you actionable things to do. Um, and I think actually doing that is a really great way to get a really honest look at where you are um, and actually inviting um, agencies, organisations like Commercial Break in there. Um, and I think it's really important that this census continues and we keep, we, we set a target and we hold ourselves accountable to it. Um, and I'm just going to ask this question to you, Israel. Um, mm -hmm. 
we um, we know that it's important from people from marginalized backgrounds to see people like themselves at work. Um, is that true of their mentors? Or the question is, can old white men help? Um, I can't be able to even articulate this. I think, so what are you, is the question like, can old, do old white men have the right to help people from marginalized backgrounds? Is that? Uh, yeah, but I think, um, would that would that mentorship be beneficial or is it really important that there's people from working class backgrounds who are acting as mentors yeah definitely i mean i think i mean if you are a rich I mean, a rich old white man i think you still can contribute but i think at the same time you do want to have a mentor that you see yourself in um i think part of that is sort of like you want to especially if they're in a position where like you feel like you want to work your way up to it's good to have someone who's from a similar background that has done the steps and been through the same similar sort of process where they can kind of guide you in a way that's a lot more candid because even with assimilation you want to feel like you're having to assimilate as a mentee and um, so i feel like yeah definitely having someone who's probably from the same sort of background as you probably like adds to that sense of feeling like you can do it too or feeling like you have someone who has they don't have maybe the same sort of privileges or they're from the same sort of like class or whatever so i feel like it it basically sets out a clearer roadmap of what they what they've done and then how they can transfer their knowledge and experience to you as well from the same background if that answers the question yeah. well, then I've answered it well but no it doesn't I think one thing that's really important is that actually if you're going to commit to mentoring someone you should do some training like to make sure yeah. that the advice that you're giving is valuable because I think you can quite easily jump into it and then actually not be giving advice that's helpful or worthwhile um, and Lisa, Lisa sorry can I just quickly say something sorry can I just quickly say something on what Israel's saying and what you're saying which is one of the things, actually, Israel, you've talked about this before. It's really nice that if you are going to mentor someone, then make it reverse mentoring as well. So if yeah. you are one of those old white guys, rich white guys, then don't just think you're the mentor. That person that you're going to men mentor is also your mentor and open your ears mm -hmm. and listen to them. And I think yeah. that reverse mentoring is, is really powerful. Yeah, and I think a good a good mentor should learn as much from their mentee as the, as the other mm -hmm. way around. Um, so one of the questions um, was uh, is around how to ingrain more incl inclusive behaviours within your agency. Andy, I just wanted to come to you on that one. Um, can you talk about some of the things that Lucky Generals are trying to do to make the agency more inclusive? I think it's it's about that sort of scanning what we're doing. It's, I, I think James made a really good point about class in particular is it's all these it is those hidden codes it's the um the culture that's sort of grown up and we don't think anything of it just because it's like a um it's the way things have always been done so do we all go down to the pub because that is a thing that we assume that everyone wants to do um or you know I, you know it, it's it, it's it's the assumptions that underpin a lot of the things we do. It's it's things like how we just being conscious and mindful of how we assess people. Things like accents, for instance, I think you've already kind of said can sometimes be um, mistaken. People can leap to conclusions about somebody whether they are articulate and intelligent from an accent and can make a massively wrong assumption just because someone has a different voice than them. That That can be and then that forces that person and somebody in the interview could have said this that, that forces that person to feel that they've got to assimilate and change their voice which is like is a is such a ridiculous change in your sort of um life to make you know how, how that that is like it sort of if you actually think about that in fundamental human terms like changing the way you speak so that you can fit in at work is like a a crazy thing to do so um but we sort of unwittingly perpetuate it because we might sort of say oh that person's you know um they're very, they're very good, but they're not a great public speaker or they're not a great presenter or something like that. Well, maybe they're a brilliant presenter. Maybe they've got loads of different qualities. And this is not about getting them to change. I think that's the right point that James is making. It's not about saying, can we train them up so that they can have a slightly more polished, smooth. No, let's like embrace the fact that they've got a different style of doing it that has got a, a different level of authenticity that, that incidentally clients and lots of us are wanting these days. They don't want to hear the polished, inauthentic voices anymore. I think there's like a watershed moment where people sort of realize that the true voice of the people that we're trying to talk, it, talk to is like more interesting. So it's it's basically, I'm, I'm probably waffling a little bit here because I think that it's not, there's no sort of, um, 
I mean, there are some sort of tangible and specific things that we can do, but a lot of it is just watching out for these subtle hidden codes and um, trying to view things through that lens and, and, and sort of think, you know, are we unconsciously? Because I think lots of people have now, I mean, the good thing is that I genuinely think that a lot of agencies have got the right, you know, um, good intentions, let's say. I hope so anyway. Uh, we certainly do, but we fail because those good intentions, we, we don't realize some of the, the, the mistakes that we're making subconsciously along the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that helps to answer it. It's just being really alert, having our antennae open, listening to people. That, that's why your, your point about the menteeship is is absolutely right. I, I do some mentoring and it's, it's got to be a two-way thing because we need to, and I am this sort of classic old white bloke, um, and we got to find out what, um, you know, uh, what is going on now as well because you can't sort of translate there's no point in me sort of saying well I, I came down from scotland 25 you know the housing market was completely different there I, I went to comprehensive school but it was like um you know 30 years ago whatever it was more than that um so those that that, that experience is different now than it is today um and we've got to learn about people's experiences in 2021 and what all that means and it's it is very different yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I can speak from experience that hiding an accent is quite difficult to do. So if you're trying to get people to do that at work, it's yeah. not going to happen. Um, so James, just um, a question. How might being working class, kind of what have you seen? How has that been preventing progression into higher positions as when people get into the industry? Wow, so there's so many things. Uh, I, okay, so first thing is the... Um, I think all the problems that exist in junior culture anyway are, are, are magnified when you're coming into an agency and, and you're feeling other. So um, the, the lack of structures for progression, what Israel talked about, the lack of training, of belief that oh, you pick it up as, as, as you go along. So all, all those issues that exist anyway just get exacerbated. I think there's, there's just a sort of a feeling generally that, that when you come in, that you are not part of that world uh, and everything you see is is telling you that so um there's just each day what andy was sort of referring to each day there's just a thousand little incidents uh from what people talk to you about so for example we've heard lots of times you know the, the kitchen conversation that when someone comes in from a working class background switches from you know uh what they're watching on tv to a work thing, this sort of sense that people don't know how to how to talk to me about that. But the, there is also, and there's a really good book that I'd recommend to to everyone by a guy called Sam Friedman called uh, the the class ceiling. That that his, one of his main points is that just as the gender pay gap exists, the the class pay gap exists. And one of the problems is is that middle class people are sort of brought up in uh, I don't mean this in a kind of Marxist way, but they're brought up in an entitled way. They know their worth, or they might maybe even got a slightly inflated sense of worth. Whereas if you're coming into an environment where you don't feel like maybe you should be there, you don't know your worth. So a big thing you, that he found is that you can be doing the same job as someone else who's middle class, and you're getting paid way less because you think you can't have that that argument uh, about money. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's there's so many inhibitors, and I think what Andy said so so well is that also just from an agency perspective, as soon as the kind of connection isn't happening properly, then it becomes like, oh, you know, they, they can't present as well, or what are they going on about, or why can't they structure their argument, or, or whatever it might be. So sort of both sides end up kind of repelling, repelling each other. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good point. And um, that's all we've got time for, unfortunately, on the Q and A. I could stay and chat here all day, and um, I'll get told off. Um, so. Um, <laughs> As a vital first step today, what we're asking people to do is to download it in the Social Mobility Toolkit. Um, so all attendees here today will be informed when this is available on the um, Advertising Association's All In Hub. And hopefully that should give everyone ways to do it. I know there was a question about how we make people accountable. I think it's about doing all of this stuff, but getting people in like James into your industry, into the agencies and making sure we listen to them and get held to account. And um, so that's all we've got time for today, but I'd just like to thank our wonderful panelists, uh, James Hillhouse, Israel Kujeri, and Andy Nairn. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.